Hi, I'm Colleen Hutchinson. I am here at the 17th Annual 2017 Minimally Invasive Surgery Symposium at the Encore Win Las Vegas. I have here with me today Dr. Kevin Hall, who is the Senior Investigator at the NIH, um, and he also did today's Minimally Invasive Surgery Symposium keynote address. Uh, he shared some remarkable research that contributes to solving the overall puzzle of obesity, and I'd like to just start with a question on what you presented today. Yeah, so I was uh, presenting some uh, research that we did on uh, former Biggest Loser contestants um, who, as many people know who've seen the show, they lose a dramatic amount of weight through some combination of uh, diet and, and exercise. Right. And um, we were really interested in better understanding what's going on inside their bodies. How much is their met metabolism slowing down? Mm -hmm. How much um, total calories are they burning? And how much of their weight loss is coming from fat versus same muscle? example. And so the main takeaway um, from that early study that we did while these folks were still in this competition was that um, the exercise that they were doing was really effective at keeping their muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, but despite what you read in a lot of the fitness magazines about muscle mass just kind of keeping your metabolism high, these folks experienced a dramatic drop in the number of calories that they were burning at rest. Right. So roughly 600 calories a day drop. I mean, that's a pretty big size meal. And in fact, it was much greater than you'd expect based on the, the weight loss that they experienced in something called metabolic adaptation. And so um, six years later, after these folks had achieved this remarkable weight loss, um, an average of about 60 kilograms over a seven month period, um, we brought them to the NIH to see how they were doing, what was going on. And uh, they'd regained on average about two thirds of the weight that they'd lost. So they were maintaining about 12% weight loss after, after six years. Um, but most surprisingly from our perspective was the fact that their metabolic rate remained relatively slow. Uh, basically at the same level as it was at the end of the competition when they were still act actually actively losing weight. And now that they'd regained the weight, we expected their metabolic rate to go back up, but it was still um, relatively slow. What would you say that means for people out there who are struggling with obesity and wanted to adapt that uh, lifestyle intervention they see on that show? Yeah, well, first of all, that lifestyle intervention on the show is completely unsustainable. Mm -hmm. You can't eat those that few number of calories, roughly about 1,300 calories a day, while doing several, you know, many thousands of calories a, a day of energy expenditure, and in fact, you know, almost 2,000 calories a day of just exercise. So mm -hmm. three hours a day, every day, seven days a week of vigorous exercise, not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so the magnitude of the effects that we were seeing, these you know, 600 calories a day of slowing of metabolism is probably related to the magnitude of the effects that they were, or the intervention that they were undergoing. This extreme intervention resulted in extreme uh, changes in metabolism. We think that qualitatively, the same things happen in people who are trying to lose weight um, by a less extreme means, but it won't amount to 600 calories a day. It's probably gonna be more like 100 calories a day so people shouldn't think that they're going to have to, um, you know, eat you know, a, a full meal less a day in order to kind of see see results. But there, these, this metabolic slowing does take place with your garden variety weight loss as well. Okay, and can you speak to us a little bit about increased appetite? Yeah, so that's the other side of this uh, this equation, this sort of energy balance equation is um, your metabolism is slowing down. That's kind of you know making people uh, lose less weight perhaps. Um, but also your appetite's increasing. Mm -hmm. And so um, we recently published a study where we quantified how strongly appetite um, was regulated um, by weight loss um, for the first time in humans, and we actually found that that was the more important factor. So um, for every, every kilogram of weight that, that people lose, their, their metabolic rate might go down by 20 or 30 calories per day, but their appetite increases by about 100 calories a day. And so the factor that we think is driving most of the weight regain and in fact the plateau that people experience six to eight months after they undergo some sort of lifestyle intervention for weight loss is primarily because of these appetite changes. Calorie expenditure changes play a role, this metabolic slowing, but it's a much smaller role than the, the increased appetite. Okay. Uh, why have you found in your research that bariatric surgery is a more effective um, is more effective for long-term weight loss than other lifestyle modifications. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Bariatric surgery, we um, is you know obviously is one of the other mechanisms of achieving large weight losses like the Biggest Loser uh, folks experienced, 
And when we actually matched up, um, pair matched retrospectively a group of subjects who underwent uh, Rowan Y gastric bypass mm -hmm. um, with the folks who underwent the, the biggest loser. Um, interestingly, we saw the same sort of metabolic slowing six months after the surgery, but one year after the surgery when those folks were ba basically weight stable at their lower weight, that metabolic slowing disappeared. In other words, they were burning about the right amount of calories at rest as they should be for their new lower body size. Um, and so that suggests to us that something interesting is going on to reset this, uh, what we think of as a body weight set point. And uh, we also see something very similar when we look at these appetite changes. If we, um, if we kind of apply the same sort of methodology to kind of assess what's going on potentially to people's appetite with bariatric surgery, it also looks like there's some sort of resetting of the set point that's going on. Why that happens um, and what the specific mechanisms are, those are, you know, those are the important questions to figure out in the future, but something clearly special is going on with the surgery. Yeah, it's still a puzzle that you're helping to put together the pieces of. Uh, with that, I also just kind of wanted to see if you could tell us a little bit about what other research is on the horizon uh, from you and your colleagues. Yeah, so we're also very interested in the question of uh, what kinds of diets, uh, the effects of not just the calories in the diet, but you know, carbohydrate, fat, and protein. Mm -hmm. um, how does that affect how many calories people expend, whether or not there's a benefit for one diet over another in terms of fat loss. And so we've done several controlled feeding studies at, at the NIH Clinical Center where we bring people in. Uh, they basically stay for uh, weeks and months at a time and we feed them all of their food and make these careful manipulations of diet. And we're really trying to quantify how big of an effect does it matter, does a low carb diet better than a low fat diet in terms of these metabolic parameters. And do you think that you'll eventually find that some diets work for some people, whereas other diets and or lifestyle modifications work for others because at the end of the day, we are wired differently? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's really the beginnings of research on this idea of is there some sort of combination of genetics, for example, mm -hmm. um, some sort of personalized diet approach. I mean, one of the things that we have right now is that practically, you know, everyone with obesity has tried a dozen diets, yeah. right? And, and they almost always never give up hope that the next diet might be the one that works for them. Um, and, and the evidence behind that is actually pretty poor at the present time. So we don't know if there is a combination between a, a specific personalized diet approach or not. There are some people who are very successful on some diets um, and other people who are very successful on other diets. But what we don't know is whether or not those same people would have been successful at that particular time in their life if they've been given the opposite diet? Is it about the social support, or is it about some interesting biological combination between that person's uh, genes and, and a diet that's been prescribed? We don't know the answer to that question yet. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Hall. We really appreciate it, and thank you for the really interesting keynote address. Thank you.